Um, Professor, Professor Dr. Yannick Matis is Professor of Organization and Innovation in the Department of Social Sciences at the University of Oldenburg and further heads an Emmy Nutter Research Group on Regional Energy Transitions. She received her PhD at the University of Oldenburg in 2010 and completed longer research stays at the University of Uppsala, at the London School of Economics in London, and at the Circle in Lund. Her research focuses on innovation in organizations and in societies. And regarding societal innovation, she has a regional focus on societal change, particularly related to energy transitions. She was awarded to um, the OLB Prize for the best dissertation of the year, the Prize for Excellent Research by the University of Oldenburg, and the Lover um, Saxony Research Prize in 2018. Um, yeah. Again, uh, welcome, Yannicka, and the floor is yours. Yeah, looks great. Yeah, thank you. Now I forgot that I have to unmute myself. So thank you very much for this nice um, introduction and of course also for the presentation, for the, for the uh, invitation. I'm really very pleased to be here and um, looking forward to sharing a little bit my perspective onto this research field with you because evidently it's impossible to cover regional energy transitions and what we've all been researching on that in uh, just about half an hour. So um, to start with, and now Noor has already introduced me so thoroughly that I don't really need to say too much on that. Um, I would just like to very briefly give you a glance of, um, so I'm starting with the technology which we tested and it worked of course. So, should now work. Um, so I will. So I will briefly say a couple of sentences on myself. Um, I'm professor for organization and all that has been said, but I think what is relevant is to understand a little bit from where I actually come um, scientifically. And um, I did my PhD more or less on the threshold between regional embeddedness, collaborative innovations, multinational companies, and in a sociological context. But for me, sociology was also new at that time. And then I realized that my topic was very, very closely connected to economic geography and um, also shifted a little bit more into that direction. So all that I'm doing in terms of research at um, that point of time is more or less at this kind of intersection between sociological perspectives and um, geography. I've also pasted a couple of um, projects that I'm currently having into this presentation. So you see that I'm doing research on um, RENEA, which is the project that Noor already mentioned, which is our regional energy transition project. And um, I'll say a couple more sentences on that later on because it's mainly the research we, I will be drawing on when I cover my own work in this uh, presentation. But I'm also, for example, just started a project that's called Windkiski, where we look at more this um, artificial intelligence and the role that might have for fostering energy transitions. And I'm also doing a little bit of research in the area of digitalization, collaborative innovation still. So that's um, basically the field that I'm coming from. And the technology is still annoying me. Um, what, what I will be doing is talking with you about regional energy transitions and this kind of cross-cutting point, sociology meets geography. And um, I then thought that it might make sense to start from the regional perspective, because I think that most of you will somehow be working in sustainability transitions if you are here. Um, and then that's why I'm looking mostly at this regional perspective and then we'll be covering different approaches from regional energy transitions and also focus on research avenues that I think are coming up just currently to give you also ideas of which directions might be interesting to tackle further. So 
First of all, what is sociology? Sociology um, is the science of the social. So I don't, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this kind of perspective because I think it's it's inherent in transitions research, but it's on the other hand also a little bit out of the classical approaches that most of us come from. And the basic concept is that we cannot look at individuals just independently, but they are connected to people in their social environment. Um, so it makes sense to also analyze how we are in, embedded into broader social structures, how these impact our behavior. For example, if we now um, look at one of the few people I see here on my screen still, Abe, um, then it makes sense to not just look at Abe as a person from a sociological perspective, but also to look at his family, his background, his um, study mates, his, his colleagues, maybe the nest context, and then see how that impacts your life, maybe your family life could be a sociological perspective, but of course also your um, perspective as a researcher. And the same is true if we now think of how people behave in such a webinar, then you don't just come into an empty room here, but there are certain rules and expectations that you have of yourself of how to behave here. And for example, it's not very likely that someone will not just unmute their microphone and start singing. Or it's not very likely that every person um, switches on their video and starts dancing, simply because we have these kind of social expectations of how we behave in certain settings. And these kind of interactions between individuals that of course could overjump these expectations and start singing or dancing, but most likely won't, this is at the core of sociological research. So now, of course, the examples were quite far away from um, energy transitions. But if we think of what is actually energy transitions, what they are doing and what they are about, then it is very relevant to um, analyze the structures that we have for social actors and the social entities to understand the changes that are taking place or also and sometimes more likely not taking place simply because we can then describe to what extent um, uh, how energy uh, change goes about. Sorry. So my perspective is, and I won't say so much about geography because I think that's a much more kind of approachable um, research field, but my perspective comes from this kind of intersection combination. So from the sociological perspective, maybe you expect that we cover questions of acceptance and we do that, but not only. We are also very much interested in looking at questions of power, of interaction, at the emergence of new norms and values, and of course, um, also processes of learning. For example, how people talk to each other, how they learn from each other, how that all works, how they cooperate, how they bring about new innovation, that are all topics of interest in sociology. And I think it's inherently clear that that is very, very much related to regional energy transitions or maybe even at the core of that. And that combined with a geographical perspective that involves questions about space, about spatial entities, about the impact of space and distance on human relationships. So we again have kind of this interaction perspective. And that together leads um, to a rather interdisciplinary outlook, um, as we had, for example, in the project Renea and some of my colleagues also here today, which is nice, um, where we have already for the last five years been researching in a quite interdisciplinary team, exactly this kind of regional energy transitions and also see that different disciplines contribute differently on to, to have a more encompassing view on that perspective. And um, so, it's nice that you are here, Mike and Camilla. Coming from this disciplinary background, um, I want to now look at why regional, like why is this regional perspective um, so important? I mean, we have big challenges. Why do we take them so locally? And um, I have brought along a couple of quotes that uh, come from the empirical field and might show you why people think that the region is so critical. So for example, someone told us in our um, interviews that we also did in the project, 
I, do, I don't need Canadians to do wind assessments for us. I can get that in Oldenburg too or in Farel. So just really close by and it's nice and it feels cozy and you look for people that are in your area. Or the second quote that is, we do it in Oldenburg with a 30 or 40 kilometer circle around, that, uh, around it. That's where we know our way around. That's where they speak platt. That's where we know the people. That's where we can go, you can go. There are now mountains. So actually mountains around Oldenburg are not so big that you can't get across them. But it's more or less this feeling of being in a place where you feel home, where you feel well. And also this kind of platt dialect that we have here is nothing that is really so spread that it would be a real criterion. It's more this feeling of trust, of feeling pleased, of feeling in the right place. Um, which, which points that simply the regional unit is somewhere where people make connections. Um, another quote is that um, someone here points out the regional energy transition is our field of experimentation. We have a very good cooperation with regional companies where we work together in the projects. Regional has such a great feel good factor. Again, it's this kind of it's nice, so nice and cozy to be regional. And it's also innovative because you dare to do experiments there, you dare to, to um, do new things that are not yet really settled and you get in touch with colleagues that, that are cozy and that's regional. And finally, um, the region acceptance must be created in the region. That's the most important thing. If we don't have acceptance here, we won't have acceptance in, in Berlin to implement the political demands at the national level. So that leads back to this kind of how do we get acceptance for maybe renewable energies? And thereby, the region is really a critical entity where we start from. So I think that already gives an empirical glance that it makes sense to look into these kind of smaller scale units and not just from the big national or even global level. Um, there are two sides that we look at in transition research generally, at least in, in my take on it, at least two sides. And these are institutions and actors. Institutions give the general rules of the game. They make, they put things into, um, they formalize things, they make them reliable and you can take them for granted. And these institutions are a complex multi-level system of relevance that are relevant. And they are of course not all regional. In the context of wind energy that we've been studying mostly in the Renea project, I would even say many of them are at the national level, but they get triggered, they get triggered down to the regional level. And of course, we also have regional, at least in a, in a federal system as in Germany, regional decisions that really impact what happens at the higher level. So we have a multi-level system here. But the actors, the actors are really influential. And these are much more rooted at regional level. And for example, Stephanie Döringer shows in her paper um, on, in, on individual agency that we have different types of institutional entrepreneurs or governance entrepreneurs, policy entrepreneurs that impact the, um, the policy making process of transitions, particularly at the regional level. So I would and claim that we have influential pioneers, that we have transformative agency, and that's often set at this regional level. There are also a couple of practical arguments for studying the regional level. I mean, as you all know, as we all know, transitions are rather complex. So if we need graphics like that um, here presented by Frank that you probably have all seen a hundred times, and I won't go into explaining it. Um, how well can we then understand such complex processes fully? How can we like derive something that's policy relevant if it's so complicated that we actually have errors and fields and then still get the claim that it's not complete, that it's not full, there are things that are not in there in a multi-level perspective. And I think at least empirically, it makes a lot of sense to then zoom into specific concrete dynamics that we find in relevant political units. And that would be in my reading, the regional level, because there we can observe what happens, but we also still have scope for strategic foresight in governance that really happens 
that something happens. Whereas if we go to the very much local microdynamic level, we could get lost in very, very small scale particularities that are maybe not so relevant anymore. We don't find policies making to the same extent. And if we are in a big game, and I guess that's rather clear, then of course the relevance is very high, but we also tend to get lost in the complexity that we might find here. So I think it makes sense to do research at the regional level, but of course we always have to keep in mind that that's not a closed container that's happening there, but it's embedding, embedded in this multi-system um, perspective where we have also a national and a global level and also take into account ideally the local level, which is of course in everyday research, research um, yeah, easier said than done. Sorry. So small scale regions um, have been my personal starting point to that um, research field. And um, originally we had quite a lot of studies in urban settings and cities on, in that field. And you've also heard maybe some of you um, the NEST, NEST webinar by Nikki on that, Nikki Franciskaki. So, um, and also quite early now, it's like 12 years ago that Frank Riel said like municipalities are the starting point now, had the initial seed beds for transition. And I would claim that we actually went beyond that now and we see that regions due to the decentralization that we have play a very, very decisive role in how we drive energy transitions today. So what is the city, what's the level that you start by and I, I brought along this kind of map that we had in Rene, you see our case studies. And for example, we started in Oldenburg, but then we realized that we basically need to analyze the whole region Northwest simply because we have also spillovers to bigger entities. So starting from a regional approach in my perspective is not sticking very neatly to this kind of closed container of the city of Oldenburg here but it's more this kind of the felt relevant region that stays small scale, but also takes into account the connections that we have to different places here. So that brings me to different approaches that we find um, for regional energy transitions. And really it can all, only be a very, very small glimpse or run through a couple of insights from the debate. The starting point for me is, is this uh, kind of space, place specificity of transitions that um, Thais Kuhnen and uh, Thais Hansen and Lars Kuhnen outlined in, in their 2015 paper. And they basically come from this geographic um, economy, economic geography direction and outline five areas why it is so relevant to be place specific. Basically a little bit what I did before, but now in a structured way. So first of all, they stress that we have urban and regional visions and policies. So this is this kind of relevance of the regional level that I showed you that there's something happening, there are local contests, local discourses, something there are, and these are very much different if you look between different regions. So it's an entity that matters politically already and um, just as well as the national level, of course, always matters. Then we have informal localized institutions that leads very much back to what I, um, to the citation of feeling home in a certain region, speaking plot, that you have certain ways of how you greet each other, how you talk to each other, how you behave. And that's very much localized. We have uh, local natural resource endowments, which um, is, I guess, quite evident. For example, it makes more sense to have wind plants here in northern Germany than in, uh, for example, southern Germany, where we have more solar energy. So these are kind of the, the very clear resource endowments that certain regions bring along. And their fourth uh, characteristic is the local technological and industrial specialization that leads to this debate on uh, clustering and um, spillovers and all these things that we have had discussed mainly in an industrial way.
but they also relate to um, services and to, to softer uh, arguments. And finally, they open up in this fifth point to a market and demand perspective to not only look at this kind of production perspective and um, stress the importance of engaged end users of direct feedback in geographical proximity. And that there's quite a lot of that market formation that um, happens in this um, demand perspective. So from a geographical perspective, it's very clear why we have a place specificity of transitions. But if we look to think back of this kind of sociological perspective that I brought in at the beginning, of course, the consequences and the underlying processes of what I'm outlining here are also highly relevant for a sociological analysis. So that leads to two challenges if we um, outline how regionally funded energy transitions are and how we cope with this basically heterogeneity between many regions that we find in this field. Um, and a couple of colleagues outlined them very nicely in, in a recent paper. And the first challenge is the multidimensionality and embeddedness of energy transitions in regional contexts, which again means we have a great heterogeneity. And this is all in this interaction between agency and institutions that take place differently in different spaces. And the second point is that the diversity of context entails a need to explain these spatial particularities in specific locations because we don't get along with overall policies. We really need to be more tailored in that. And taken together, they make it necessary to really look at regional heterogeneities and look how regions work down their own particular energy transitions. And um, last ties, Amy and Robert here suggest that we can therefore look at energy transitions in, of, and by regions. Which is means that we basically structure the whole debate we've been having a little bit more neatly on what we actually are interested in and also glance at the different perspectives that we need to understand energy transitions more fully. And this um, is also summarized in this nice picture here um, in, in that editorial where we see that we have um, transitions in regions and that goes to an interest mainly in this kind of contextual factors. I think that's mostly what we really think of when we think energy, regional energy transitions. At least for me, that was originally the focus that I, I was interested in understanding mechanisms, processes of regional energy transitions, of the involved institutions, of the configurations that take place thereby. But this is not all we should be interested in. So we have also this kind of off regions that um, concerns the outcomes, the impact, the consequences that regional energy transitions have for housing, for employment. And that's, of course, very, very sociological questions that pop up in that context. Then we have um, the transition by regions, which is closely linked to the agency dimension. And we've had just in the last five, maybe already even 10 years, quite a couple of contributions that stress that we need to understand agency better, um, that we need to understand better how this is um, coupled with structural factors. So in that sense here, agency means that we can look at regions as agents, but we can also look at actors in the regions and at extra regional actors that affect regional transitions. So it's not, again, not this closed container perspective, but it's an interplay between agency for the region, basically, so transition by the region in that way. And then finally, um, what I think is also very timely is that we here find um, the value chain dimension that stresses that transitions vary across value chains. And depending on if we look at the generation, the transmission, the distribution, or the consumption, we will have different regional routings. And I will um, switch to another example um, that also illustrates that a little bit in just a couple of minutes.
coming from where does regional energy transition start was my personal um, starting point were learnings from the regional innovation systems perspective. And this perspective depicts regional innovation systems or then um, as systems in which firms, organizations, and individuals are systematically interacting and they learn from each other. And this kind of learning is a very, very wide definition of innovation in, in a way. So we have always an interplay and that sounds very much like, like the, the mainstream state of the art in, in transition research today. We have an interplay between institutions as rules of the game organizations as collective actors and individual actors, and we need to look at these different facets. We, coming from a regional um, innovation systems perspective, what I found most, most helpful, I must say, in my early work was this kind of different functions that are involved that shape institutions because that allows us, or shape innovation, because that allows us to have a rather encompassing perspective onto what happens in a region and to look at different actor groups and different institutions. And um, together with Andreas and Jens, we called these subsystems or subsystems in, in an early paper. So these subsystems are um, administration and politics that come from this classical risk approach, but are usually not distinguished. Then we have economy and industry, of course. We also have intermediaries, such as labor unions, but also network organizations. We have research and institutions, and we have civil society and finance. And all of them are kind of part of this classical risk approach, except social society, uh, civil society, which I think is key if we want to understand energy transition, simply because we have quite a couple of associations that play an important role in shifting or not shifting um, these regional systems. So this gives, gives kind of a whole perspective onto the different involved actor groups in a region. And if we then start from there, um, we can combine them with this multi-scalar perspective that I also um, mentioned earlier and look at regional configurations of, as we did here, um, my colleague Sebastian Ruhr and I, um, of technological innovation systems. And this is, of course, a little bit uh, coming from this risk debate that I just showed you, but also connecting it with the technological innovation systems debate that many of you will probably be familiar with. And the key message without um, wanting to go into too much detail here is that we have intersections between regional innovation systems and technological innovation systems. So this kind of green boxes, the technological innovation system, and these um, ovals here are the regional innovation systems. And at the points where they cross cut, we can see that the regions fulfill different roles in this kind of global game of producing and distributing technologies. So we have the different subsystems involved here that are the orange boxes. And um, that is what the risk perspective contributes. And we have the technology focus that um, the TIS perspective contributes. And when, if we, for example, look at localist grassroots configurations, which is simply a classical risk type um, introduced by Phil Cook ages ago, then um, we can see that this localist grassroots configuration has many firms that are active in the TIS, and they are also very much connected to what happens in the region. So it's not so critical, at least in the ideal typical perspective, to see what happens globally, simply because it's a rather self-sufficient region that does state-of-the-art research and development and production and so on, simply because of its own endowment. If we come from the globalist richest configuration, then we have more bottom up, uh, top down perspective here, where we find not so much in the region that is actually part of the TIS. It's just this big box up there that is in the case, maybe could be manufacturing. But what happens in the region is rather a little bit more independent of that specific technology. And then we have the interactive network configuration, 
where RIS and TIS are very much intertwined, but also spill over to other technological systems that are basically should be painted in down here, which means that it's innovation has both an internal and an external reach. And taken together, we can deduct from this kind of observation or study we did here that different regions due to the heterogeneity play different roles in technological innovation systems, which moves away from this kind of optimal regional configuration that we are after, but we are more after different roles that perform different, different regions that perform different roles for a whole technological innovation system. I will just very, very briefly say something on the value chain. Um, as you probably all have seen this paper by um, Christian Linz and Bella Truffa, I won't go into explaining the global innovation systems because I mean, we are talking about the national, at the regional level, but what the core idea here is that if we look at valuation and um, at innovation, we might have a different, different roles or different routing of technologies in the region or globally. And if we transfer that to a regional level, um, then Sebastian Rohe has broken that down and can show that we have simply different configurations of regions and different, four different value chain steps. So that, that's basically the crucial point. We can't just say, a technology is rooted in a, in a region in that or in that way, but we also have to take into account, and that goes back to this editorial um, that I mentioned earlier, we have to look back at who, into the position of the value in the value chain, because if we look, for example, at upstream, that might be a different way of being rooted in a region than if we look at the market. And for example, in this case, um, Sebastian looks at onshore wind energy. He found that we have a very globalized system um, for the production, the, the technology development, but then for the market anchoring, for operation and maintenance above all, downstream, we are very much regionally rooted. And this explains that we, or means that we really need to look at regions in a very differentiated way and that we can combine it with very different perspectives if you want to really understand what happens regionally for energy transitions. Even so, and that's more a little a small and short disclaimer at this point of time, um, a couple of colleagues have recently highlighted and many of us work in that direction that is not just about technology, but also mainly about social innovation that drives regional energy transitions. I would mostly call that social dynamics that take place in, in the regions. But um, here, uh, a couple of other colleagues are more talking of the social innovation and both make sense that if we start from this TIS perspective, we are in a very technological perspective. So we need to combine that again with a more social focus to have and to acknowledge the importance of agency, but also of course of institutions and structural conditions. And then if we have these kind of transitions happening, however they really occur, which we, in my perspective, still don't fully understand, um, Camilla and I suggested that we look at social, technical, spatial, and temporal aspects, which I still think is quite a useful triology to understand regional energy transitions. Then we have sometimes this kind of stylized perspective that transitions undergo faces and that they kind of build upon each other. This is, of course, very, very stylized and not um, as clear cut in practice. And, and we get this kind of picture that once we come to a consolidation, then everything is nice and neat and tidy. And the starting point for this paper was um, that in the end it is not because we have the consolidation and then we have this kind of tipping point where we don't really know if we now start with the next phase of energy transitions and, and the regional development goes on, but it might likewise turn downhill and not perform so well as expected. And in working on these papers and undergoing several rounds of research as it sometimes happens, we got more and more aware of the fragility that is inherent 
in all these phases, in the initiation, in the expansion, in the consolidation. So basically, the whole paper is about this kind of need to stabilize regional transitions that is so fragile and not necessarily does really occur. So we always have to keep in mind that even if we have the perspective of being well underway, transitions remain very, very fragile and dependent. And that is particularly true for this regional context, dependent upon appropriate policies from all levels. With that, I would like to turn to three research avenues that I identified. Um, there are, of course, huge more, uh, many more, and um, these are very, very partial. But um, one of them is that I think what we need more and what has been happening in the last couple of years increasingly is to connect concepts and also to define concepts clearly. And um, for example, uh, Camilla, Hannah and I have tried to connect regional industrial path development with transitions and thereby we identify that we need to look at interrelations between paths, of course, coming from very mainstream economic geography, but also have to consider these interrelations between regions and spatial scales, which we, which we also have a lot in transition research. And we always need to consider, and that is mainly even the main contribution of that, um, the social interaction, which I think I have also tried to stress in, in this presentation a bit, that this is really at the heart of transitions. And then, and here comes the donut uh, economy, um, the, the boundaries, the ecological boundaries. We cannot just define blankly what we would like and how we interrelate and how transitions concerns industrial path development if we are in a very normative concept of sustainability transitions. We really need to also consider what is actually ecologically feasible and what makes sense. And I. Um, and, and we defined a research agenda based on that, but also a couple of colleagues have done, I say, similar things and also call for similarly for um, acknowledging this kind of green and just path development as Valitz um, and Berche van Velen do in, in a very recently, I think it was just published last or a week or a week before, uh, paper where we, or um, then the concept of trinity of change and transformative regional uh, change by uh, Marcus and Marku, where, where we also see that we kind of in this sense at the moment of connecting between different debates and between different approaches. So that would be one way to go. Um, another way to go for me is uh, the role of organizations in energy transitions that for me starts, or at least I got very much aware of that in a special session at the EGOS conference in 2020 that Jochen Markert, Bertie Soppe and Tarantune had it. And um, in that discussion that we had there, we were also agreeing upon the importance of actually understanding better the role of organizations that are more like a meso level between this institutional and actor level that we now have more or less established and the role these organizations play in regional energy transitions. And I think that actually in the last three years, surprisingly little has happened on that. We still don't really understand how organizational activities impact the transition process and vice versa. And that's not just about production, but it's also about being involved in, in discourses, um, building infrastructure and so on and so forth. And in a recent paper with a couple of colleagues, we have tried to at least identify indicators that we could be looking for if we want to push that research further. And finally, um, we have a small and nice and I think very promising body of literature that connects or looks at transitions in my, and the interfaces between sectors and technologies in this multi-system interaction approach that actually today has no regional touch whatsoever. But if we think that we are in transition phase two that you've probably also come across it, so we have this kind of accelerated transition phase, then the need of such an integrated perspective between different technologies 
gets more and more important. And um, that's where we now find emerging literature on this kind of multi-system interaction. So what does hydrogen have to do with wind and so on? What does energy have to do with heating? Um, to see these in a little bit more integrated way, I think would be very promising. And to transfer some of these findings to the regional level and what that means for concrete regions that tend not to have all technologies in place, of course, would also be um, a field where I think we need much more research on. That makes me come to the end. Um, I have just a couple of points that I want to highlight to before uh, closing. So I think that we need this kind of regional energy transitions perspective to understand the social dynamics that are inherent in transitions better and at a small scale, scale level. Um, but even at a regional level, it is still not so trivial to understand what which processes are actually involved. So I mean, at least I have the feeling it's still worth working on that and working on that further. But if we understand regional heterogeneities, that is, in my perspective, also key for designing more tailored policies and for getting away from this kind of one size fits all approach that does not so much work anymore in a very decentralized energy um, system that we are having. Regions are thereby, of course, no closed container. I've said that, but they're also embedded in national and in global systems. So we also need this kind of multi-scalar perspective. And um, I've identified three current trends in the debate. And um, there are, of course, many more other. I'm also looking forward to hearing your approaches on that. For example, connecting concepts and levels in multi-level approaches, multi or approaches from economic geography and transition, but there could be many other directions here. Um, to look at the interaction between organizational change and regional transitions, and um, to look at multi-system interaction and the specific outlet of that in a regional setting. So I've uh, cited quite a little bit of literature and I will just leave that very briefly here. So um, you may maybe also later on uh, make your notes on that. And um, yeah, I would like to thank you very much for the attention again for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to discussing with you. Okay, thank you very much for that clear, very well organized presentation.